1953, at age 16, Irene Coons of Utah secretly married a man who was already married to her half-sister. My mother warned me against polygamy because she was four generations from polygamy and she had seen her mother and her grandmother suffer trying to live this law. Polygamy had been banned by the Mormon Church in 1890 and it was illegal in the U.S. But Irene belonged to a fringe fundamentalist cult and was duty-bound to become the second wife of Verlin LeBaron. I was taught from the very beginning, for as long as I can remember, that we were to live the principle, which meant that we should enter into plural marriage. According to the principle, women would go to hell if they didn't marry into polygamy. Irene hardly knew Verlin the day she married him. In fact, they had barely spoken, and she had fallen in love with another man. This was by far the hardest decision she'd ever made. I felt absolutely terrible giving up someone that I loved in order to live the principle. The threesome hid from the Mormon authorities. One of their own priesthood brethren performed the quick ceremony in a secluded park. When the moment came for my sister to take my hand and place it in her husband's, I saw this sadness in her eyes and I knew that she was just living her religion and trying to smother her feelings. As disappointing as the ceremony had been, Irene's wedding night was to be stranger yet. When I got there, we had literally no intimacy the first night. He just had me lay on his arm and he told me that his, I was the key to plural marriage. I was the key that was going to get him into heaven. And someday he hoped to have at least seven wives and 50 children. I lay there so disappointed because I wanted to be more than somebody's key to get somewhere. Verlin and his first wife, Charlotte, fled to Mexico to begin a life far from the reach of the law. Two months later, Irene joined them. Well, I was absolutely shocked when I arrived to the ranch. It was nothing but three or four adobe houses. My husband led me to a three-room adobe hut and said, welcome home, Irene. And he told me that we had no electricity. We had no inside plumbing. If I had known Spanish and I had had a way and hadn't been so sheltered that I was so full of fear, I would have hitchhiked out of there and gone back to Salt Lake City by myself. Irene stayed, but soon realized that poverty and jealousy of Verlin's other wives would be her greatest challenges. I really didn't feel loved at all by my husband because he couldn't show me any affection. And it was against our religion to have intimacy except for procreation. So we didn't bond very well. And especially, you couldn't really talk to him or say what you wanted to say him because you had another wife in the house. Within four months, Irene was expecting. But by then, Verlin was busy courting his third potential bride, Lucy. The pain that you feel when a man is giving another woman attention, it's like having your skin peeled from your body. When my baby was born, Charlotte was there to attend me with a midwife. Berlin was not home, and I gave birth to this little baby girl. But I did, found out later that I had toxemia, and that is what she died of. She only lived for 20 minutes, and then she passed away. Irene was distraught, and Verlin's news that he would now marry Lucy was hard to swallow. We were always told to don't betray the brethren, don't you betray the brethren, and yet when they married uh, 14 and 15 year old girls we kept our mouths shut when they married a, uh, a widow and then married both of her daughters that were young we kept our mouths shut when they whipped women gave them beatings we kept our mouths shut we did not betray the brethren as years went by more wives meant deeper poverty and more children to feed Irene faithfully delivered a child every year because Verlin couldn't make enough money other mothers had to go to work so at Verlin's request Irene ended up taking care of 26 children, getting 15 of the older ones ready for school each day. I had to stay up the night before and iron all their uniforms. I had to get up in the morning and make breakfast, which I usually made hot cakes or whole wheat mush. And we didn't even own toilet paper. We would cut up little rags to put out in the outhouse. We were that poor. During her 12th pregnancy, Irene developed blood clots in her legs. Their polygamist cult didn't believe in medical treatment so she discreetly visited doctors who gave her serious advice. They told me if I had another child that it might be the end of my life, 
and my husband did not believe in birth control. We were told you'd go straight to hell if you practiced it. And I felt that I could not go on. When I had my nervous breakdown, I was absolutely in total despair. And I had been threatened with hell for so many years if I didn't give my husband wives and I didn't live up to his expectations. I'd been threatened with hell. And all of a sudden, during that breakdown, I looked around and I realized that I was already in hell. They couldn't send me any place because I was already there. Still, Irene endured two more years and incredibly delivered her 13th baby. However, her endurance had its limits. When Verlin announced that he was marrying wife number 10, she took seven of her children and headed to the U.S. In our religion, the children belonged to the man, but I took them and stole his children and went to Vegas to a new life. I had one bedroom and I had seven children, but I was in heaven. When I first moved to Las Vegas, I ran into some very nice Christians that actually helped me out with food and clothing for my children. And I realized that they weren't these wicked Gentiles that I had been taught to believe as a child. I saw the love that they had and it really influenced me to see how they acted. After three years, Irene returned to Mexico. She wanted her children to see their father and she asked him for an official divorce. He wouldn't even consider it. He was in a rush to leave for one of his church conferences in Mexico City. And I told him that I was leaving him for good, that I was taking the children, going back to the States, and that I was just living in denial of all of this, and I wanted to leave his religion and leave him and move on. And he looked at me and said, you know what, maybe I just won't be coming back and I'll do you all a favor. Verlin never did come back. On the way to the conference, he was killed in a head-on car crash. All 58 of his children attended the funeral. Three years later, Irene moved to Alaska to live near one of her married sons. He had become a Christian and invited Irene to her first Christian service. During the singing of the 42nd Psalm, she had a breakthrough. I cried out and I said, God, whoever you are, God, I want to know you. I want to know the truth. And in that moment, God actually spoke to me and he called me by name. And he said, Irene, where have you been that you have never praised nor glorified me? And I started weeping from the depths of my soul to think that for so many years, I had worked and given my husband wives, working my way into heaven. And Christ whispered and said, I am sufficient. That day, Irene went to the altar and her life has never been the same. She tells her story in her book, Shattered Dreams, and her message is clear. She was completely set free from pain, depression, and 28 years of deception and bondage. God lifted three freight trains of disappointments, of jealousy, of heartache, of disillusionment, of being left alone and all the things that happened. He lifted those three freight trains from my shoulders. And I tell you that I have had nothing but peace. Christ said he will give you peace and joy and love. And I've had a smile on my face ever since. And I'm glad to be a child of the King.